on Vision Christian Radio. Neil Johnson with you. It is the Thursday edition of 2020 and a conversation I think you will definitely be very interested in as we get underway today. We're going to turn our attention to what happens to all of our worldly possessions when we die. And as I mentioned just a little earlier, you know, that's a big contrast, isn't it, to the sorts of things we might ordinarily talk about around our Christian message of what happens to our eternal soul when we die. Well, today we're giving some attention to the importance of having a will and leaving an inheritance, caring for the needs of the people we love and the organizations we care about. Now, if you die without a written will, the court decides how your assets will be distributed according to a strict legal formula. Having a will may give you some peace of mind knowing that those you love will be provided for and potential arguments between family members can be avoided. Well, we're back today with finance expert Alex Cook. Alex is a former stockbroker. He's been a successful financial planner and he is the founder of Wealth With Purpose. His ministry is to help equip Christians to honour God with their finances by teaching sound financial skills. Alex Cook, a special welcome back to 2020. Thanks, Neil. Great to be with you. Happy New Year. I'm not sure you can still say that, though, in on February the 20th. 29th, but uh, well, you know, it's good to be back with you. It's happy leap year, and and this is the first time we've <laughs> actually, actually had a chance to have a little catch up this year, 2024. So yes, uh, just fabulous to be able to talk to you, Alex, and get your insights onto these things because uh, this is an interesting one. Is it just a your overall perception here? Do uh, do you know if you know that most people who are uh, into older years and dying? or even the younger years, because you can be taken out by all sorts of things. You can be hit by a bus. Uh, you could, All sorts of things can happen. Um, do most people die without a will? Are you aware of any detail around that? Yeah, so the stats that I last saw, um, and that this is a while ago, but I suspect it hasn't changed, uh, is 40% of Australians die what we call intestate, which means you die without a will. So it's about 40% of Aussies. I suspect that hasn't changed. And the reason why I say that is, as a financial planner, uh, one of the things I often have to remind clients of year in, year out, is to get their will done. It's one of these things that people put off there's something about it because i guess we're facing our mortality and of course having to have potentially tough conversations with with uh, our children or with our parents if they haven't got it in place um there's something about it that makes it feel uncomfortable we as believe know where we're going so you would think that uh we'd be very confident talking about it but it's a topic that gets put off that's uh, the way it is. And it's all very well to have a current will, something that you might have prepared of recent times. So what about uh, if you prepared your will 30 years ago and maybe you've just been happy the fact that uh, you've got a will, it may be at a lawyer's or it may be at a public trustee or however you've got your will placed, uh, that sometimes a will needs updating. Uh, how, do, how do you think about updating wills? Absolutely. Look, absolutely. Very important. So the way I answer that is very simply either A, you update when there's a significant change in circumstance or B, you review it every three years. Now, when I say review it every three years, I don't mean that you necessarily change it, but more that you check the appropriateness of it in terms of, for example, your executors. So these are the people that are going to manage your estate when you pass away. Are they still the right people? Because one of the mistakes people often make is choose someone that's older than them and therefore likely to predecease them. So you want to choose someone who's not going to die before you. Um, so there's all those kind of things that you need to do just to make sure that it's still relevant for the circumstances. And of course, also uh, that it's going to go to the right people. Uh, because to me, ultimately, a will needs to cover three key principles, and that is making sure the money ends up in, in the right hands at the right time uh, with uh, the right amount of funds. And, and so, of course, that means making sure that the people that you originally planned to leave it to, you know, still around, still appropriate. But as our circumstances change, those three factors obviously need to change as well. And of course, it'll, it'll depend on your age and stage of life. So... For example, I've got young children and therefore I need to make sure that there's sufficient funds 
for my um, you know for my wife to be able to raise those children if something happens to me. For other people, you know, if they're uh, you know say more mature than myself, let's say 70 or 80 years of age, they need to then make different considerations because maybe their kids have grown up, maybe their kids actually don't need all the estate, which is, you know, a topic in itself, you know, how much should we leave to our kids, which is a, you know, big question we can, you know, we can grapple with as we go. Um, but certainly update it regularly is the, the simple answer as your circumstances change. So at what age ought you have a will? I mean, are we going right uh, back to school leaver stage when you start to get your first job and you start to accumulate a little bit of uh, a few assets here and there? Um, when do you get a will, do you think, is the ideal? Is there a particular time or do you wait till you're married so that you've got, you know, a joint way of looking at things uh, what's your wisdom on that it, it's a, it's a great question and i'd probably answer it by saying certainly at the latest when you get married at the latest that is how i'd respond to that but also to say that maybe um you've accumulated assets so you, you know you could be 25 you've had your first job you, you've started to in uh, to grow your capital your, your superannuation fund um that's when you should start thinking about it i mean when you get your first job and your employer starts paying your superannuation, one of the things that you complete on that superannua superannuation application is who do you want to get your super when uh, if you pass away? And that's actually a very important document because what a lot of people don't realise and a very important thing to convey to listeners is that your superannuation is not actually covered by your will. It's what we call a non-estate asset. And so therefore... When you're 18 and you do get your first job and you are starting to get paid super, you could literally start thinking about it at that point. But to answer the question, though, absolutely no later than when you get married and B, as soon as you start accumulating assets. Uh, for some people, they'll be saying, well, my super is my biggest asset. Is it a little bit like a proxy will if you've nominated in your with your super fund uh, who you'd like your super to go to? Is it is it in that sense a little bit of a sort of a proxy way of uh, identifying where you'd like that wealth to go? Uh, because you might not own a, a home and uh, you might not own an expensive car or two sitting on the driveway. Uh, how do we look at that sort of thing? Is it yeah, so look with your, yeah, so to answer the question with your superannuation, as I say, it's a, what we call a non-estate asset. And so the very important document that you complete with your super fund is what's called a beneficiary nomination. Now, there are two laws, different sets of laws that apply to your superannuation when somebody passes away. The first one is superannuation law and that the superannuation law requires that you only pass it to someone who is a beneficiary. So that's either a spouse or a child. Now that child can be of any age. But then a second set of laws apply and that's tax law. And tax law works slightly differently. And that is that it says that a uh, spouse can get, get your uh, superannuation and your children can also get your superannuation. However, they'll pay tax on it depending on whether they are a minor or whether they're no longer dependent. So for example, a 30 year old child, not really a child anymore, will actually pay tax on your superannuation, whereas your spouse will not. So that may actually influence who you are going to leave your superannuation to. Now you might say, well, actually I don't have any kids and I don't have anyone that I'd want to uh, leave it to. That's a person, I might want to leave it to an organization. Now. Under superannuation law, you can't technically leave it to an organisation. But the way around that is with your beneficiary nomination super on your super fund, you leave it to your estate or what we call your legal personal representative, which means it then passes through your will and therefore you could leave it to the organisation that you choose. So very important to make a few of those if you like distinctions around the rules because it's not it's not complex but it is important that people know what those rules are uh, that's interesting having some sort of way of you know it's like a maybe it's a legal loophole uh, who you leave that superannuation to and you can leave it to your own estate and goes through those processes Hey, I just want to uh, just to share with you a few moments because there's something listeners might have been hearing on Vision about wills 
and uh, there's a uh, relationship that Vision has with an organization called Safe Will and uh, a leading online legal will writing platform and they deal with lots of not-for-profit organizations and so there's this uh, bit of partnership that's going on at the moment and and just for listeners benefit uh, up until Sunday when you connect with Safe Will on the Vision website at vision.org.au uh, you'll be able to do your will absolutely free now it apparently takes as little as 20 minutes something of a streamlined process and it will have the oversight of a lawyer before it's actually finalized now just let me just give a little disclaimer here there's no obligation to support vision Uh, visions doing this and we're talking about wills today that you might have a church or you might have a mission organization or a charity that you'd like to include uh, with your will uh, as part of your uh, estate. And uh, so my encouragement for listeners is to check out what is happening there because, as I say, this week only, uh, getting a free will. Uh, safewill.com is the name of the site, but certainly the vision.org.au website, so many listeners are familiar with, you might like to check that out. Uh, just to, to talk about this uh, for a few moments, um, do you know any ideas what it might cost for people ordinarily getting a will produced, uh, maybe with their lawyer or however that works? Any thoughts from you here, Alex? Because, I mean, is this a good deal, a, a free opportunity to uh, get a will? It's a very, very good deal. Um, So uh, the way I answer the question comes down to one of complexity. So, for example, a typical uh, family where it's, you know, it's a a stable marriage, uh, you know, as in not a blended family, that kind of thing. If you go to what I would call your local suburban solicitor and get a bit of a a package of a will and powers of attorney because they're important documents as well, you're probably looking at $1,000 for that very basic, simple package. Um, What we do, if people's affairs are complicated, they probably want to talk to a a proper estate planning lawyer like the people at Safe Wills, um, where they can deal with more complex situations. Now, by complex, it can be two kinds of complex. There can be complexity in terms of the family situation, i.e. blended family, second marriage, uh, children to different uh, partners, that kind of complexity. But then there can also be financial complexity, you know, they might have a family trust, they might have uh, a large amount of capital, they may have a farm where, you know, one kid's involved and the other kids are not. So there's that kind of complexity, in which case my strong advice is making sure you do get that legal advice, because those situations are more complex and require a proper estate planning solicitor. Okay, well, I want to open that, our talkback line. Five thousand, and that could cost five thousand dollars. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, uh, so it's a substantial saving, and uh, for listeners, uh, you might like to just check that out on the Vision website. Uh, I won't mention it uh, uh, numerous times, but I'll mention it a time or two more during our conversation today, because uh, as you can hear, this uh, may actually be a real saving and a real opportunity if you don't have a will to actually get a will. And uh, it may be just the thing that you need right now. But you might have questions about wills, about estate planning. Well, I do want to open our talkback line on 1-800-316-316. Let's take some calls straight away, Alex. Uh, David is on the line from Ballina in New South Wales. Hey, David, welcome along. Hi, Neil and Alex. Um, great, uh, great to talk to you this morning. And Alex, uh, you do a great segment. We listen to you regularly on this uh, station. Thank you very much for that. And this is a really timely Thanks, thing. Dan. Wills, you know, because... Uh, and you're emphasising how important they are. And I'm just going to give you a quick uh, example of what happened to me in the last few months. Um, a friend of mine I've had known for 18 years, she died or she got uh, cancer and she rang me. I went and visited her. It's a fair way away from where I am, actually. And um, she didn't have a will. And I said, look, you need to get a will. Anyway, I organised a solicitor to do a bedside will at the hospital. And while I was back in Ballina organising things, she passed away. Um, the will was handwritten. It wasn't drafted, but it was, it was, honky. It was you know, right. It had been done with a solicitor. It had been all the things, checks had been done, but it was a handwritten will. Well, she'd passed away and I was uh, made executor. And I was made actually everything, uh, Alex. I 
that's just a friend. It was a bit of a shock, but I did organise the funeral, and um, I even went down and organised. I actually did the did the funeral myself, the the message and the and the uh, all the thing anyway. And um, after the funeral, we had about sixteen people there, about half and half, half were family and half were friends. I found out from the friends that this friend of mine was well loved, but I found from the family she wasn't very well liked, and I was attacked. Would you believe? And even four days after the funeral, while I was cleaning my friend's house, out her rental house, the daughter turned up and wanted to know where the superannuation was. <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I was given a pretty hard time, which I thought was unfair. I rang my solicitor, and he just said, "No, nah, it's all in your court. They can't do anything to you." So, praise the Lord, there was a will done because I could have been in a very, very difficult situation. David, uh, thanks for sharing that story. And uh, Alex, what stands out in David's story to you? Uh, well, first thing, thanks, David. It's a, it's a great story and it's a very common story. Uh, you know, these days, you know, we live in a broken world and we often have these family situations where people are, you know, their relationships with their either their parents or their children is not good. And so this, this happens a lot. And so we see a lot of people challenging, even challenging wills. But that's but why it's so important to get a proper will done and put in place and done properly because people make lots of mistakes. Like they often get, for example, um, beneficiaries to witness it, which makes the will null and void. So there's all these kind of things that can occur. But it's so important to, in my view, um, not only plan it out well, but also as the person who is writing the will to make sure your wishes are known to your family members so that when you do pass away, uh, everyone knows what's going to happen in advance. And that will often, and then when you, you can explain your reasoning for doing things, because often what happens is someone dies and then all of a sudden this wellspring of bitterness <laughs> rises up because no one knows why things were done that they were. They don't know the person's intentions. So it's really important, as you say, A, to have a will and B, to plan and explain and to your beneficiaries what's going to happen and why you've made the decisions that you've made. So thanks, David, for sharing that story. It is a, a very common one, um, and uh, it's a great one for people to learn from. So uh, thanks for sharing. David, before I let you go, was there a good outcome here? Yeah, it was very difficult, uh, Neil, because um, this friend of mine, she hadn't had any contact with her two, her son and her daughter for about 20 years. So I actually never, I didn't actually know her son and her daughter. I never met them. She didn't ever want to talk about them. So there was some very deep hurt. And, and and as it as it has turned out, um, you know the friends who came and spoke to me after the funeral, they were you know very happy with what I would said and it represented my friend properly. Um, and it wasn't just her 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 kids; it was her her, her siblings. There was only I think she has three three sisters and a and a brother. I think one only came to the funeral, and some of them lived in the same town that she died in. So it's pretty. Hard wow. to get your head around when you hear about things like that. I, I'm still struggling with that, Neil. I still yeah. struggle. Now, she was a born-again Christian, this friend of mine, and sure, she might have changed because from what I understand, she hadn't seen her family for a lot of years, and maybe she was a different person back then, but this was just an example of, you know, long-held bitterness. And looking back at the situation now, I, I can see why she made me executive because she got to be buried in the cemetery she wanted to be in, I don't think that would have happened if the family had taken over. Wow. Uh, David, thanks so much for calling through. Uh, that is an amazing story and I think just demonstrates some of the reality of what goes on. And, of course, uh, some people are in that situation where they're estranged from their family and uh, they haven't seen their family for 20 years. All of a sudden, uh, they're on the deathbed and uh, the family's all turning up and it's a little bit like vultures coming around, I imagine. Mm. So, uh, anyway, but thank you so much. We're taking calls on 1-800-316-316. You might like to ask a question, make a comment, even have a critique. Let's hear from Jan in Eight Mile Plains in Queensland. Hey, Jan, welcome. (laughs) Oh, thank you, and uh, thank you, Alex, for your program. Really appreciate your sound advice. Um, Just a question, what's your view? We have four children, and we're looking at inheritances and would like to give equal distribution to the four of them, but they all have different needs, and two of them have gone through divorces and have no home. The other two are well set up and um, very established and stable. So... 
don't want to cause any strife amongst siblings, but um, I'm leaning more toward those who are disadvantaged, who have no home, who just live in rental properties and who are suffering more financially. I'm leaning toward that they get a greater portion. What's what's your thoughts on that? Alex? Look, it's a... Yeah, look, it's a fabulous question. And to be honest, this is one that many, many parents grapple with for all the reasons you described so beautifully. Um, a couple of comments. Firstly, I, I'm not a solicitor. So I, I look at these things, I guess, from a financial planner point of view. And what I, I so they'll advise you in the guess, the more complexities of it. Um, principle that generally people start with is obviously wanting to treat their kids fairly, but not necessarily equally. The other thing I often encourage people to do is if their children, if some of their kids are struggling, is often to help them now rather than later. Um, so that's something you might want to consider helping, you know, now rather than out of the estate. And also you can do things like, for example, you might uh, lend a child, let's, let's make up a figure, $50,000, and then in the estate, they have that deducted from their portion. So that way you're helping them now, helping them with the need to get ahead, but they can then, it can be a portion later. Um, the other thing is if you have kids with that have special needs, often we have kids that maybe are disabled or kids that have, you know, mental health issues or alcoholic issues, that, that kind of thing. That's a kind of common complexity that exists out there is you can make special provisions in your will through what's called a testamentary trust um, to protect them. So for example, uh, you might with your four kids share the funds equally but with the ones that have special needs, they may not get the capital as a lump sum. They may get it as an income stream. That way you might be protecting them, for example, from themselves because they might have bad spending habits. Uh, they may be vulnerable and someone might take advantage of them. And a testamentary trust, which is a thing a, an estate planning solicitor will talk about, is a way of protecting those children. And it can protect them in the event of divorce and things like that as well because that money then protects it from that, uh, the spouse that's left. So there is lots of things you can do, um, but obviously as a parent, the, to me, you, you don't have to treat them equally, but you just want to make sure that it's fair. The other thing I would encourage is open conversations with them all so they can see that the thinking process that you're going through with. Now, ultimately, it's your choice, your, it's your business, and you have to make those decisions. But I believe that the more free and frank and open conversations, the less likely for conflict uh, and uh, you know, it protects everyone involved because what you don't want is a situation where the four kids end up fighting afterwards yeah. and that after you're yeah. gone. And that does happen a lot. And that's why I say having those frank upfront conversations in advance uh, can do a lot to prevent that down the track. Yeah. Um, so look, there's a few little tidbits, um, but mm. I, I would certainly encourage, uh, you know, an estate planning solicitor who deals with it more regularly than someone like myself and who can deal with the complexities around that. Mm -hmm. Jan, was that helpful? Yeah, yeah, it was very helpful. I actually took notes, so <laughs> written to notes. So <laughs> thanks so much, Alex. Really appreciate that. God Thank bless. you, Jan. Uh, yes. God's blessing on you. And, uh, I mean, that response in itself is enough to say, I'm going to listen to this podcast again later because a lot of uh, people might be thinking, wow, that is uh, full of wisdom. Hey, let's squeeze in one more call before the news. Uh, Susan is in Eaton's Hill. Hello, Susan. Welcome. Hello, I've got a very um, short question, hopefully. Um, years ago, and thanks for your program, everything's wonderful on vision. Um, years ago, we made a will. I'm married and we've got two daughters who are now 28, 26. In the will that was made when they were only three or four, we said, you know, that we wanted so-and-so to look after them if anything happened to us, et cetera, et cetera. Should we update the will, um, you know, because um, they're older now and, you know, everything in the will is not quite as um, what it was at that time? Good question, Susan. Let's bring Alex in. Yeah. Uh, just a short while up to news. Uh, thoughts for Susan? Yeah, look, great question. The short answer is yes, because it was done so long ago and obviously they're now grown up and presumably that when you mentioned you had someone to look after them, you had like a guardian in mind. Now that they're grown up and if they're reasonably what I would call financially independent in the sense that they're, you know, they're no longer 
uh, coming to you for money. I was going to say that in a funny way because kids never stop coming to parents for money necessarily. <laughs> um, but but more the point that you know they're mature age and at 28 and 26, you may want to obviously change the will. You may also even consider them as executors of the will if they're mature enough. Um, you may also consider them as powers of attorney on your affairs. So if something happens to you while you're still alive, that if you trust them and they're reasonably financially savvy, that they can actually help you. Um, so there's all sorts of considerations. My view is given the time that it's elapsed, their circumstances have changed, they've grown up, your, your assets presumably have also grown. Uh, it's now time to, uh, to review it and, uh, and get something new done. So by all means, uh, yeah, go for it. Susan, thank you so much for your call. 1-800-316-316. To be part of our conversation today, a question, a comment, a critique, a short story that might be uh, just shed light on what we're talking about. Uh, We're about to break for news. Alex Cook is our guest. And just to mention uh, that uh, there is a uh, partnership deal with the organisation called Safe Will, a leading online legal will writing platform, And up until Sunday, that's this coming Sunday, when you connect with Safe Will on the Vision website at vision.org.au, you'll be able to do your will for free. Uh, It takes as little as 20 minutes. Maybe that's for the simple one. A streamlined process. It'll have the oversight of a lawyer before it's finalised. No obligation to support Vision. But you might have a church or a mission or a charity that you'd like to include in your will. Uh, some callers ready to go, but just want to uh, just uh, thanks so much uh, for those callers waiting patiently. Before we do, though, I don't want to miss the opportunity to talk about what it is that our Christianity brings to the thought of our estate planning. Uh, Alex, any thoughts here around uh, the Christian wisdom on estate planning? Absolutely. Look, I think the most unique thing it brings to estate planning is a different mindset. And the best way of giving an example of that is when when I think about, uh, say, doing a will, the question people always ask them is, who am I going to leave my money to? That's that's the normal question that people ask. And, you know, many people are thinking, you know, do I leave it all to my kids, for example? But the unique Christian way of thinking about it is, well, who am I going to leave God's money too. So in other words, estate planning from a Christian perspective, it's really your final act of stewardship. And because as Christians, we believe that the money that we have in our possession is in fact really God's, uh, we need to think very carefully about who we're going to leave God's money to. So for example, if we have children that don't necessarily share our Christian beliefs, should we leave all our money to them? Now, I certainly believe you should definitely should leave them some, but should you leave all of the money to them when we could instead sow into kingdom activities and kingdom purposes? So that's why I say the unique thing it brings is a new way of thinking. But I want to quote sort of two passages to, to I guess, frame it, both from Proverbs. So in Proverbs, it says, a good person leaves an inheritance for their children's children, but a sinner's wealth is stored up for the righteous. Now, many listeners may have heard of that, but it's interesting that the scripture here says that we should leave an inheritance for our children's children. In other words, not just our kids, but our grandkids, which seems to me to imply that Christians should also think multi-generationally. But also one comment I do want to make, sort of separate from the money piece, is around our legacy. And that's really the idea that to me, the ultimate legacy we can leave is a spiritual legacy, and that is the legacy that we leave the good news of Jesus Christ to our family. That, to me, is the ultimate legacy. But, of course, we're talking about money here. Uh, another fantastic one is also in Proverbs. This is Proverbs chapter 20, and it says, An inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. Uh, and so, I, you know, I always think of the, um, you know, the prodigal son when you think of that passage, but also just the challenge listeners here is to think about your children, how old they are, how mature they would be when leaving the money. Uh, Often, you know, it wouldn't be particularly wise, for example, for an 18 year old to receive a million dollars, maybe not even a 25 year old. These days, people are often leaving uh, their money to their children, but at a later at a later age. So, if they gain it hastily in a very early uh, age, are they going to are they mature enough 
um, to handle that money wisely? And often the answer to that is no. So the point here is to say that Christianity does bring this unique way of thinking and challenges to think who are we going to leave God's money to and what will be the legacy of that money? You know, at the end of the day, you know, we come into the world naked, we leave it naked and we've got to leave all that money behind. So who are we going to leave it to? What are we going to sow into as we leave this life? And uh, that to me is the unique mindset that Christianity brings to this estate planning discussion. Well, let's take some more calls. Melanie is in Victoria. Hey, Melanie, welcome. Thank you. Um, my question may be a bit um, unlikely to happen. My husband and I, um, we have four younger children, um, 13 down to three-year-olds. Uh, we're the only Christians in our family either side. Um, if we both did die, my question is... Um, if, if we're putting a, a non-family relative down um, because of the Christian factor, wanting our children to be influenced that way, how likely is that to um, be contested? Um, and because there is a gap, if my eldest child, um, would she be able to look after her siblings? At what age would that be able to occur, please? Alex. Look, it's a fantastic question, and I'm actually in a very similar situation. Yours are 13 to 3, mine are 15 to 5. So I'm in a similar phase of life where I'm thinking through all these issues uh, myself. Um, but to, to answer your, your question is you can make all sorts of provisions in your estate. And this is where you do need, a, as I say, and as someone, a proper estate planning solicitor to think it through. But... Um, Obviously, the challenge you have is who's going to be the guardian. So in other words, who's going to be the person that's raising the children? I suspect with your eldest who's 13, they probably legally need to be at least 18. I, they need to be an adult in order to be able to look after minor children. And obviously, you'd have to consider the appropriateness of that. But there's also, um, this is where the, I mentioned earlier on air, I don't know if you heard, we talked about testamentary trusts. You can, uh, as part of setting up a testamentary trust, so what happens here is when you, you die, the assets from your estate can pass into this trust, trust structure and someone acts as the trustee. In other words, they're the person who has to abide by the terms of the trust and you can stipulate what the belts and braces are of that trust and how you want it to be handled. And you can state specific things like paying, for example, for a Christian education that they go to a, you know, a Christian private school. You, you can state a lot of those things in what you want to have done. So to some extent, you can have a reasonable degree of control. Obviously, if that person, the, the trustee, is someone who doesn't share your belief, that, that, you know, they're not going to necessarily be sharing the gospel. That, you know, there may be all those kind of issues. It may also be that Rather than having a, um, a family member, maybe you've got a really close Christian friend who would be willing, and I, I've got this challenge as well, to look after four children. Of course, you can make provisions for it financially, so through insurance, so that uh, there's enough money to raise the children. So this friend of yours who's a Christian friend uh, can actually look after the children and they have the financial resources to do that. So the short answer is there are lots of, possible solutions that you in, that you can uh, consider um, and think those through and make it very clear what your intentions are and obviously choosing very carefully who that guardian will be and potentially the trustee of the testamentary trust that your assets would pass into to help raise those children and provide for them in the future. So the answer is yes, you can do a lot, but it obviously won't be won't be perfect. Oh, I certainly, you know, you can't rule from the grave is a common expression you may have heard. But um, the good news is, Melanie, you can do things. Uh, Melanie, uh, does that answer your question? I think there was a there was a second question in what you mentioned. Uh, yeah. You might need to remind us of that second yeah, question. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Neil. I just so my my biggest concern is that um, if if my relatives, being non-believers, um, don't like that we're not giving them. Um, you know, the children to look after, can they contest who that, um, the, did you call it a guarantor is? Um, is are they likely guardian, to be able to guardian. contest the yep. guardian? Sorry. Okay. So, Sorry. so if, you, uh, if you included a, you know, your church or a charity uh, into your uh, estate, um, the likelihood of that being contested, a, a quick response on that one, Alex? Uh, so my understanding is, in theory, they can contest anything, right? 
However, if it's all done properly, they won't have a chance because mm. if something's been prepared legally, uh, as in by a proper estate planning solicitor, uh, you maybe you've accompanied the will with clear statements of intent. So, you know, often people refer to it as like a statement of wishes. If a judge, you know, if it was sitting before a judge and he says, right, there's a testamentary structure in place that the trustee has to manage it as per the terms of the trust on behalf of the benefit of the children, and there's a statement of wishes clearly outlining the intent, uh, then to me, it would be very hard for a family member to contest that um, irrespective of their opinion. It won't matter if it's all been done properly. Melanie, I hope that's answered your question there. Melanie in Victoria, thank you so much for your call. Let's take some more calls. Rod is in Brisbane. Rod, welcome along. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Neil and Alice. Great talk today. Thank you. What are your thoughts, Rod? Well, my question is, um, I'm in the second stage of my life. I've My kids are grown up um, and I've been married and divorced. So at the moment, my kids are written the only benefactors of my will. But I am about to get married again. To a, to a lady that has some adult children as well. So I'm just trying to figure out how that all works. What's the balance there? Do I change my will straight away? Do I wait a while? Do I, who do I include in that will? What's the process there that would normally be yeah. taken? Good question, Rod. Uh, Alex? Yeah. Uh, great, great. Look, fantastic question. And as you can imagine, very common scenario in today's day and age. Um, for, and as I do want to say, I'm not a solicitor, but I do always say to people in this what I call blended family scenario to get proper estate planning solicitor to work through the legal aspects of it. Um, I would say that what you want to do, though, is start thinking now as to what you would like to happen. So that way, when you sit in front of a solicitor, you can pretty much outlay your intent. And so that will be saying, right, you know, for example, in the event that you pass, that your new wife is well is well looked after. And there's all sorts of issues. For example, say you want to leave the house, for example, to, to your kids, that she can still remain in that house, for example, until uh, she passes and then the money goes to kids. So there's all those kind of uh, legal issues that a solicitor can address but then there's also her children as well and how she wants to handle it so to me the best thing you can do is sit down with your spouse to be and start having these very open discussions about what you would both like to do start with that um, and have and really have open and frank discussions about that and then go to the solicitor and say look this is what we've sort of semi-decided how does that look what can we do to do that and then once you've done that assuming good relationships with all the adult children and obviously there may be issues with your kids with, and with her and likewise her kids with you you know there's all that sort of complexity is you then start to make sure that everyone is aware of the situation so the whole family at least knows and knows why not necessarily that might not 100 agree but at least everyone's on that same page um but with any blended situation always important to get everything done properly through an estate planning solicitor, but start with the immediate dialogue of you and your spouse to be, you know, wife to be. Uh, Rod, does that answer your question? Anything further? Uh, yes. No, I don't think so. I think that, yeah, I just need to sit down and have that conversation, I suppose. Fabulous. Well, Rod, thank you so much for your call. 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation. We're talking about wills and estates. Let's hear from Kate in North Queensland. Hey, Kate, welcome along. Hi, Neil. Hi, Alex. Thank you for a very relevant conversation. That's all good. What are your thoughts, there, Kate? Or you've got a question? I've got a question, actually. It was um, more to do with the fact of uh, I'm a single um, working mother and I am just was wondering, obviously, I know the importance of having a will in place, which I'm looking to do this week with the opportunity that Vision and Safe Will are providing. Um, my question was more geared about I don't. I know it's all God's resources and money. Um, in terms of logistics and stuff, I don't actually have um, anything I can think of at this point to leave, other than um, a superannuation-related, um, you know, insurance policy. I'm just wondering: is, is there a general list that um, for people to consider 
to make sure that they're covering all bases with things they may not think of um, to leave. I mean, I live paycheck to paycheck, as um, I know a lot of other people do in similar situations. So I'm just don't have a big nest egg to sort of divide up between my children or anything like that. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, is there a checklist to make sure nothing's missed out of the ordinary? Alex? Yeah, the answer is, yeah, 100%, and certainly solicitors will have that. How, I was going to ask you, Kay, how old are your kids? Uh, they range in age from 10 to 18. 10 to 18, okay. So, um, I mean, there's a range of things to think about there, and obviously the main thing is, uh, well, a couple of issues. One is obviously around who's going to look after the younger ones if something happened, but also mm -hmm. what financial provisions need to be made. So maybe there's things like life insurance that needs to be put in place. Now, if that's already in place, then the big question is, who is the policy owner? For example, is that your ex who may own that policy or is that you or is it the super fund? So you can make sure that the money ends up in the right hand. So that's, so to me, the principle that you want to adopt when you're thinking about this, so it's, the first thing there's the checklist, which is, you know, just working through all the different things. But the principle you want to have is making sure the money ends up uh, with the right amount of funds in the right hands at the right time. That's the, the principles that you need to think about um, and then think through the, the range of issues, whether it's my superannuation, my insurance, uh, accommodation for the children, guardianship. Um, I mean, obviously, if I think if you Googled estate planning checklist, you'd probably get a whole list of things that maybe I can't, you know, just download on air. But certainly a good solicitor, and I'm sure the Safe Wheels people will actually have, I'd be amazed if they don't have a checklist of things for you to consider and uh, to, to work through that. Um, because it, obviously you don't, you don't want to miss anything and it sounds like they're going to go through and have a proper estate planning solicitor check it all anyway and therefore prevent anything from being missed. But it's a fabulous question um, and important to make sure you don't miss anything. Kate, anything further to add? Um, I was actually going to ask something else just really briefly. It's probably a, probably a fairly obvious question. Um, if someone isn't legally divorced, is, is, is there an option to, is it, unless they're legally divorced, does that mean that they, their ex-partner um, or their official still lawful spouse still has access to that? Or is there enough provision in the will to actually specify that without there being an official um, divorce put through at this stage? Yeah, so my understanding is obviously a will, say you had a will previously, and that becomes null and void on divorce, but you can make a new will in anticipation of a new event. So in this case, becoming legally divorced, you can make a new will in anticipation of that event. Um, probably the other thing for you to consider though, apart from the will side of it, is your superannuation because uh, often people don't realise it's a not a state asset, it's not covered by your will. And often people have their former spouse uh, on their beneficiary nomination for their super. And even if you're divorced, that divorced spouse can still receive your super, even though the will says something different. And it's because people have failed to change it. So you want to consider your superannuation as a, as a separate thing and that the beneficiary nomination is very clear that you want it to go to obviously the kids but, or even potentially into the estate and then gets dealt with by the will. Um, but a solicitor and Safe Wheels, I'm sure, will talk you through that. Kate in North Queensland, thank you so much for your call. Uh, Kate did mention a safe will, and uh, I've mentioned this a couple of times over this hour. Uh, if you visit the Vision website, vision.org.au, you might have heard that Vision is partnering with Safe Will, a leading online legal will writing platform. And up until this Sunday, when you connect with Safe Will on the Vision website, vision.org.au, uh, you'll be able to do your will for free. Uh, it takes, uh, I'm told, as little as 20 minutes, probably for a, a simple sort of a, a will, uh, a streamlined process. Uh, and it'll have oversight of a lawyer before it's finalised. Uh, there's no obligation in there, as I've said, a time or two uh, to support vision in there. Uh, but you might have a church, a mission, a charity organisation that you would like to include. Um, maybe you would like to include Vision. That's uh, I'm not saying don't, uh, but uh, there's no obligation in there. But check out that Safe Will 
uh, you'll be able to find a banner, I think, on the Vision website, vision.org.au, and uh, find out about that because a uh, tremendous opportunity, a significant saving. And if you haven't got a will at all, perhaps the easiest way you'll get a will as early as today. Let's take another call. Betty is in Bundamba in Queensland. Hey, Betty, welcome. Oh, hi, Neil. Hi, Alex. I don't know if you can answer this, Alex, but it's just a quick question. My daughter informed me, my adult daughter who has uh, adult children, informed me that they made their will with the uh, public trustee. And I just remember recalling things from my dad, what my dad used to say. Is this a good thing or not? Public trustee, Alex. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Um, I'm generally not a fan uh, because it's expensive and it's very slow. Um, and it's not done with the same, uh, I guess, love and attention that a loved family member who is the executor does it. Um, sometimes it's appropriate if it is a complex uh, conflict situation. So, for example, let's say uh, the person who's you know doing the will, their kids don't get along and they're likely to, to fight it out. Having the public trustee there... In other words, where there's no friend, there's no other relationships that could break down as a result of it. In that sense, the public trustee can be a very good option if there's high probability of conflict. But if the probability of conflict is very low, then to me, it's an expensive and slow option. So I encourage people to have, you know, a, you know, a younger close friend or, fa or your family member, you know, the children, if they get along well and all, all that kind of thing. Um, but it may well be appropriate if there's a high chance of conflict. Mm. Uh, Betty, anything further to add? No, no. It's just, yes, it's just something I remember my dad always okay. saying. And All right. Yes, thank you very much for thank that. You thank for you for your call. Well, we've got to put a line under calls. Let's see if we can squeeze one more in. Anne is in another North Queensland caller. Hey, Anne, need to be quick. What are your thoughts? Um, um, my contact with the public trustee on three separate occasions has been quite a disaster so um, prolonged and and inefficient and handed on from one person to another each time you try to contact them okay all right so uh, it's a, not a, it's, not a, a, it's a yeah look this is a common experience and this is why I said avoid it if you can um, because it's slow the person won't have the same degree of care. The only exception, I think, is if there's a high degree of conflict and you're trying to prevent further breakdown in relationships. But I think Anne's comment is a very valid one and certainly my experience as well. Anne, thank you so much for your call. A hey, time has run out. And just to bring you back, I do want to mention Safe Will, a online legal will writing platform. Uh, there is a partnership there with Vision right now. And up until Sunday, you connect with Safe Will on the Vision website, vision.org.au. Uh, you'll be able to do your will for free. Um, Alex, you could put this off uh, or you could plan to make mm. up some uh, appointments, uh, find a, a lawyer that you can get your will made up. Uh, you did mention earlier, sometimes that can be an expensive exercise. Uh, some might be thinking, is this too good to be true? Well, uh, it is a partner deal at the moment uh, with Vision. So um, the recommendation might be to check that Vision website and you'll find mm. the safe will banner there. Just click on that. And that'll come up with the details of how you might be able to proceed. Uh, Alex, just this thought of if you put this off now, you might not do a will at all. Uh, the necessity, uh, you know, is this an urgency for people? What do you think about uh, about not putting this off when you've got an opportunity like that? Uh, look, I've seen this for 25 years of giving financial advice. Do, my simple response is this. Don't delay. Uh, it's an important act of Christian stewardship. Uh, it's very important for your family to protect your family. By doing this properly, you'll save so much heartache and pain, especially if it's done, you know, professionally. Uh, and look, this, uh, as I say, I'm not familiar with safe wills, but I would say it sounds to me like a fabulous opportunity for people to get started if they haven't done it. And so don't, don't delay. And, uh, you know, there's always a little bit of uh, due diligence uh, for all of us. Uh, just check on whatever you might need to check on. Uh, there might be some uh, checks and balances uh, before you proceed, but uh, you can check out that detail 
at vision.org.au. Click on that banner there, and it's about safe will, and it is something that until Sunday night, uh, your opportunity to do your will for free, vision.org.au. And Alex, to connect with you, let me give that, uh, that detail so how listeners can connect with you, wealthwithpurpose.com. And on your Wealth With Purpose website, you've got free ebooks, you've got a My Toolkit, you've got free videos and podcast content. Uh, do you have any more on estate planning that people might be able to access uh, by way of some, uh, some resources that you might have there? Absolutely. It's certainly covered off in our courses, and in particular one called The Retirement Revolution where we cover estate planning comprehensively because it is a, you know, a very important topic. Uh, one that people like to put off, but one that, uh, that we need to act upon as believers. Okay, wealthwithpurpose.com to connect with Alex Cook. Uh, you can follow him on Facebook and on Twitter. There's even an Ask Alex at wealthwithpurpose.com email as well. Alex, always great getting your insights. Thanks so much for joining us once again today on 2020. My pleasure. 